having some pleasure from Real Moon Gaming, and I'm sitting here with Charles Dunbar. <laughs> oh God, that's gonna go on the blooper reel. <laughs> we no, I um, we are our channels are always 18 plus, and and people are like, hey, is it because of content? And they're like, no, our president can't not drop the f bomb every three seconds. <laughs> so every stream is 18 plus. When we do charity events, I kind of I kind of reel it in. You've it. just got to learn how to swear in other languages. Yes. I want to be Firefly. I just want to swear. I, I, ever since languages. I started saying Scheisse, oh, real? What though? That sounds interesting. What is that? Oh, it's German. What's it German for? You don't want to know. If you, <laughs> wait, if you don't know, mm-hmm. you're not watching enough TV. Yeah. Because <laughs> we've all seen that episode of South Park. <laughs> we all know what it means. Yes, we all know what it means. It's also the one thing you can't say in the South Park universe anymore, or else it summons a demon to destroy all of reality. That'd be kind of cool. Make a fun convention. We had Apocalypse Con one year. It, it fell over the Mayan the, Cl- the Mayan Long Count in 2012, and we actually had an alternative at the con in case something horrible went down. We would do these panels. Nice. Uh, of course, nothing happened on Long Count Day except I got way too drunk off of Everclear for the first time. And never again. Oh no, Everclear is like the only hard liquor I'll drink now. Oh, okay. Like I won't sense. drink any other hard liquor. Uh, it's just beer and Everclear, and only Everclear if it's made by my friend Alan. <laughs> he has really good Everclear. Um, the uh, I I know I know you like TTRPGs. I do. Um, so I thought you would like the uh, what was the uh, the thing where where God pulls our souls up to heaven if we've been good little Christians. What's the rapture? The rapture. So remember when the first of this 12 raptures happened, mm-hmm. we were at Bertucci celebrating my birthday. And then we, while we were doing this, we all like waited to see if everybody was going to just drop dead, except for like us heathens. And uh, that didn't happen, but we made a, we made a zombie campaign Based on that moment where everybody did go up except for us and everybody's body popped up and became zombies and we had to fight our way back to our house. That is a fancy way of doing the, uh, of doing the rapture. That, yeah. that, that's pretty cool. It was a lot of fun. We lost a friend. It was okay. That'd be a good <laughs> premise for a dread game, to be honest. That would oh, be. that would be a good premise for it. My, my dread games are all the same. They're all based in some iteration on the movie Saw. Oh. Um, and the last one was a cross between Saw and Vampire the Vampire the Masquerade. So it was one of those get it was one of those get out of the place. But if you don't do like that one arbitrary thing that Jigsaw throws in there, everyone you're going to die. Vampire the Masquerade clan. I have to ask you for me. Yeah, uh, I'm a Zamitsi. Um, I've been a Zamitsi for a very long time. I'm waiting for them to do the Kickstarter for the Zamitsi book just so I can throw down money to make my character canon. And we're done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've already done that for Exalted. Nice. My dragon blood is going to be in the book. I, I paid the three four hundred dollars to make her. I was originally a Bruja, but realized quite some time ago I'm a Malkavian, and that's just the way it's going. Everyone to starts as a Bruja or a Toreador. <laughs> Everyone starts as well, a Bruja. Well, okay, or a so I was Goth. I had a choice, or I still am Goth. But when you're when you're teenage Goth, you have a choice. You can yeah. either be Toreador or Bruja. Yep, that's it. That's we it. had one gang girl. That was it. My well, the character before I went to full Zamitsi was like my character was a regal gangrel, and from the Dark Ages, and I loved the character. But a lot of her personality shifted over onto my D and D paladin two years ago because the Zamitsi shall not be denied. I mean, wouldn't you want an eleven hundred year old Banff ass kicker who can just tear your skin off and be like, "We're done here"? She has a really fun discipline power where she can just pull your skin off and use the skin to make a cocoon and turn you into something. She just uses the first half, pulls your skin off, and lets you die. <laughs> and um, very soul eater. <laughs> why? Why would she care? She's a Zamitsi. Exactly. I don't have to follow your morality. Exactly. I'm ancient. <laughs> I'm better than you. Um, well, she so, doesn't go that far, but she is pretty badass. So you do anthropology. Now, yes. maybe we should talk about who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather just have nerdy conversations. With nerdy conversations are fine. Nerdy anthropology is fine. I wish there was more nerdy anthropology going on. Me too. I mean, it's there. You got to find the right university. You got to find the right program. You got to find the right professor. And then you got to find the right way, just proper way to, 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 to do the PCU method for graduate school. Have you ever seen PCU? Yes. The greatest line, the line that informed me as a college student more than anything else. This is like senior, is senior year of high school. I am, I am at my aunt's house waiting to pick her up. And I put this on with my dad 
and we are watching this movie, and I am laughing my ass off, and we get to the part where the graduate student is trying to prove the Kane Hackman theory. Wherever oh, no. you are, anywhere yes. in the world, there is a no. Michael Kane or Gene Hackman movie yep. on TV. And the, the prospective student says, how are you doing that in college? And Jeremy Piven's character gives the greatest line ever. This is college. You can major in Game Boy if you know how to phrase it. And that literally is how I have done my entire academic career. Find something you love and then find a way to make it sound intellectual. Exactly. And then the best part about that is not only will you get your degree, but all of the people that you're researching for, you can write the book for them. And then they're going to feel good about it, Ooh. which is kind of like what um, Henry Jenkins was doing back with um, with uh, textual poachers. It's kind of how um, Fred Patton was doing stuff when he was writing or like when when Helen or Fred Schott do their thing. They are they they have that intellectual background, but they write for the fan and the fan comes away saying, there are other people like me that notice this. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I, I don't do it as much as I used to. I admit I don't do it. My last, my last three books were literally on Shinto, hell, and Christianity in Japan. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait, okay. So chicken and egg, what came first? Your, your love of history or love of Japan? Or was it just straight Japanese history? I mean, I've always loved history, but if you want to talk about Jap the Japanese history, it literally goes back to when I was like seven and I was watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I really loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then one day my mother comes back from the bookstore and she just hands me this book called Secrets of the Samurai. You can still buy it. Yes. You can still buy it. I saw it in Barnes & Noble a couple of weeks ago. And it's just a basic overview of samurai culture. I mean, I now know that this book is terrible. <laughs> like, it is so horrible. This is literally the textbook case of, of Gaijin writing book about samurai for other Gaijin. Uh -huh. And I can pick the entire book apart now. But when I was seven, it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And it introduced me to the Minamoto clan and the Genpei War. And I remember doing a project in, um, it was fifth grade. I did my history project for world history on the Genpei War. And my teacher was looking at me saying, I mean, I know you like samurai, but that is a very, very bizarre time period to pick. It's very specific. And I launched into the 20 minute <laughs> rant about Minamoto Yoshitsune, original Bishonen. And it just, yeah, that actually has been my thing for even before anime was a thing. If you really want to look at it, I was into Japanese history first, then I was into Sentai, then I was into anime. And I got into anime in the weirdest way possible through a card game. Which one? Anime Mayhem. Oh, okay. I've heard of it. 1990s game, uh, anime-inspired collectible card game. They put out a Dragon Ball expansion, and everyone in my card shop was playing it. So that's how I got into Dragon Ball. Didn't know a thing about any of the characters. And then I walked to the coconuts down the street, bought a bunch of VHS tapes, and I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. My first, my first VHS tape anime was Cutie Honey. That that is definitely, and that's when I knew I was bisexual. That is that is, <laughs> that is definitely a start. I I, I, I love Cutie Honey. Um, I do. I can still sing the Japanese theme song in my head. I'm hearing it right now. <laughs> the, I'm hearing it in my head right creepy, now. The creepy, creepy uncle. The girl with the girl with the teeny butt. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the butt. That's, that's the opening. The, the opening line is to see that girl, the girl with the teeny butt, oh. is the opening line to Cutie Honey in English. And I mean, no, no, for me, my early tapes were, were Dragon Ball, Gundam Wing, and Armitage the Third. Nice. And I was very much into that because of, because of that card game. And I didn't have cable TV yeah. until like 2002. Uh, so I didn't have the ability to watch adults not i didn't watch adult swim i didn't watch um tsunami that whole thing just missed me entirely mm -hmm. and then i would get tapes from my friends like all those kenshin tapes that my friend my friend had and we'd be watching Roroni kenshin like like on my my 13 inch tv vcr combo just devouring oh hey this is an anime about an actual japanese historical period allow me to research the bakamatsu i'll be back in like two days and i went to my college library and found the section on japanese history which admittedly was like 12 books and i read everything i could about the bakamatsu <laughs> it's it's like it's like my knowledge of japanese history is almost sequential it was like it was like heian edo meiji and then everything else 
And one of my biggest gripes is almost every Japanese history book you find, unless you're reading a history of Japan, almost every Japanese history book you find starts in the damn Edo period. As if everything before that didn't happen. All the cool stuff with the samurai and the warlords and Oda Nobunaga and like the Game of Thrones era, none of that stuff seems to happen in Japanese history textbooks. We start with the founding of the Bakufu under the Ieyasu Tokugawa dynasty, and then it just goes straight to the modern day. I'm like, where's all the cool stuff, though? That was boring compared to everything else. Everything else was awesome. Well, Japanese and and Japanese mythology and er, Japanese mythology is just overwhelmingly amazing. Just make sure you're finding the non-imperial stuff. That's the biggest thing about Japanese mythology that I have, that I have to make mention of. And I'm going to be doing it in Shinto for Otaku tomorrow, a weeb's guide to respecting the kami. Um, you got to you got to separate the imperial mythology, which okay. is pretty much the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki from everything else. <laughs> and when you really want to have some fun, you start doing the deep dives into like Ko Shinto and like ritual Shinto, and you find even more interesting stuff there than okay. just the gods and heroes. Because remember, the gods and heroes exist to justify the imperial family's right to rule. Yeah, <laughs> and it's kind of fun. And and Japan has a, has a, like a lot of people kind of get like mm, when I say this, um, but as a huge horror nerd. Japan has like kind of like a fetish stranglehold on horror that cannot be competed with anybody else. And when, cause so we were at your panel supernatural smackdown mm-hmm. last night where I was yelling from the back of the room. Yeah. Um, and when you brought up the split face woman, which is one of our favorites, mm-hmm. um, specifically because we play a video game, where they were creating a character. They were creating a character, and it, she was supposed to be... They originally called her the Split-Faced Woman, but mm-hmm. she didn't look anything like the Split-Faced Woman or act like her, and I got very angry, and oh, then they no. renamed her, and I was like, good for you, because I was going to not be happy about this, and she turned into the spirit. So that Japanese woman who was sliced to pieces, mm-hmm. and now um, she haunts people, and she puts them on hooks and kills them with with katana and stuff I love like that. that. It's wonderful. I'll, I can, I can send you the, uh, the picture of it. It's great. Yes, the, that, that, the, that, the trailer. That sounds amazing. It's wonderful. Sounds but, like evil within, but not bad. Exactly. So, but uh, Japanese horror is just, li- is literally the thing of nightmares. And, and when you're presenting some, some of the, um, some of their greater folklore that I hadn't even quite heard of, I was like, who hurt you? <laughs> Everything comes from somewhere, but to keep like to keep telling these tales, you're like, man, that that's gonna be a lot of therapy later. <laughs> I love to point. I like to point out when people talk about about like the stranglehold of Japanese horror. You got to understand something about Japan. Japan horror is very fatalist. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the reasons when you watch a lot of J horror, you don't have survivors because Japanese horror is incredibly fatalist. Everyone dies. We're all effed. Let's just leave it at that versus Western horror, which usually plays off the hope analogy and very, everything very has much, to have a happy ending. That's a conversation. Have, we have Not a happy ending. And at least to have at least a little bit of hope unless your yes. name is Rob Zombie. And what I, what I, what I really enjoy about it is Japanese horror takes that fatalism and just throws it right in your face. American horror takes the time to build atmosphere. Yeah. So that's why I don't have sides in the Ring versus Ringu fight. Ringu is ridiculously fatalist and ridiculously terrifying for how fatalist it is. Yeah. The Ring is an atmospheric mess, and they spend so much time setting up to scare the hell out of you that it's worth it. Yeah. And that's something that I really enjoy about the di- about the differences between the two. Do you know do you know the one uh where you get a you get a weird ring on your phone, you answer it and you hear yourself dying and like it tells you. Yep. So because I love horror so much, I'm like I'm going to put this ringtone on my phone. And I went into the bathroom. It was like it was nighttime. My husband wasn't there, my roommate wasn't there. I'm in there, I just got out of the shower, I'm in my bathroom and then like my phone goes off and it's that tone and like i look like out and it's like perfectly in the center of my bed and i don't remember putting my phone there and i immediately turned on every light in the house changed my ringtone <laughs> turned on some happy crappy and uh, like animation like kids animation thing and waited for everybody to come home and i never did anything that stupid again <laughs> i play kakarenbo that was that was insane. I don't uh, think we know. Do we know that one? It's okay. So you take one. you take a doll 
you pull out all the stuffing, you replace it with, with um, rice, fingernail, and hair clippings, and then you stitch it back up. And when I played it, my friend was an idiot. He also put his blood into the doll. Oh, no. And we stitched it up, and you take you get a bathtub, and you fill it with water. You get a pair of scissors, and you get a handful of salt. We forgot the salt. And uh, what you do is you put the bear on the ground, and you say, we're going to play hide-and-seek. And you hide, we'll find you. So we go in the other room, we count to 20, 10, and we count 10. Okay, right after we come, we find the bear. Okay, found you. You pick up the bear, you stab it with the scissors and throw it in the bath. And okay, now it's your turn. You're it. And then you go and hide. And we went and hid. And it's a stupid game kids play. And then suddenly we hear a splashing sound, a wet thump. My friend's dog starts barking. He whimpers. We hear a crashing sound. We come out of where we were hiding. The, the bear is face down on the bathroom floor. The scissors are out of its chest and near one of its little fake hands. There's blood on the scissors. The dog has run through the screen door into the backyard until the day the dog died. It refused to come back in the house. So oh we took God. the doll and we burned it. <laughs> and never did that again. I never said we didn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that's what happened the time we played Cock and Rainbow. But, I mean, and then I go to a convention and I see at the con, let's play Cock and Rainbow. I'm like, you are definitely not getting the point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anytime somebody's like, come in for, come in, you know, come in for like a Ouija board. And we're like, we're going to burn this building to the ground. <laughs> well, I'm not worried about Ouija boards. That's just Parker Brothers separating you from your money. Now, if you wanted to play Kakuri-san. Now we'll have some fun. You just get me the sticks. Of, ooh, I should see if I could do that tonight at the tea house. That'd be fun. That's an idea. Get some get some sticks and a plate and see if we can make this work. Um, so, I mean, like, if you want to have some fun with these little Japanese horror games, have fun with the Japanese horror games. They are crazy, and you can do some crazy stuff with it. But, like, a lot of things, the Japanese horror is rooted in this idea of fatalism. And fatalism is a thing. And when you when you when you see how much fatalism there is there, you eventually learn to learn to separate that out. I mean, the most fatalist movie Japan has ever made that I have seen is still Godzilla. Yeah, that is the first. That is the best. And I'm loving. I love every second of watching that thing. Two very quick things sure. before before they kick me out of this room. One, could you just really quickly uh, do your uh, PSA? I have a PSA. Uh huh. Oh, that PSA. Yes. I hear people mispronounce. Yeah, we're at an anime convention, and you hear people tell say, "Oh, look at that cute little cosplayer. She's so kawaii." No, you're pronouncing the word wrong. The word you are looking for is kawaii. Kawaii Kawaii means cute. Kawaii means scary. So, if you are referring to that cute little cosplayer, she is kawaii. If you're referring to the demon behind her, that is kawaii. If you are referring to that demon when he eventually has a soul change, that is kawaii, and then the girl becomes kawaii. But just remember, (laughs) kawaii is cute. Kawaii means scary. And when you say she's so kawaii, that sounds like you're saying scary. Uh, I'm kawaii. That's fine. Yes. Um, and then where, where can we find you and where are you going to be next? Today? Um, no, I mean, like, where can we find um, you online? I actually don't do much with the study of anime website anymore. I gave that over to Old Dominion University a couple of years ago, and they haven't had time to update it. You can find me on the Facebook. Facebook slash study of anime is usually where I post when I post these days. Twitter? Uh, I don't use Twitter anymore. Oh, okay. uh, Twitter turned into turned into a cesspool, unlike uh, certain other online internet message boards, and I just decided I didn't want to deal with it anymore. I had one at Tengu Talks, but I haven't bothered to deal with it in over a year. And what anime are you, what conventions are you going to be at next? After this, it's Teco, Boston, CPAC, CloverCon, Anime North, Kineticon, and that's straight through to like July. Wow, that's a lot of conventions. Um, I'm actually doing far fewer this year than I did last year. Last year I did 29, 28. Jeez. This year I'm doing 13, I think. So yeah, that's but that's my schedule. Like next month's going to be very busy between Boston and Teco being adjoining weeks. It's going to be crazy. Well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Yeah. I could talk to you for hours. Oh well, that would be fun. Well, I mean, you just find me. You know where my table is. Yeah, I know where your table is. Thanks so much. Have a great day.
thanks so much for watching. If you were entertained by that video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe for more wacky zany content here at Real Women of Gaming. And uh, oh, here are two randomly selected videos that YouTube thinks you enjoy. There's uh, there's this special awesome one over here on the left, and there's this crazy wonderful one over here on the right. So you just uh, just just click 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 on just just click on one of them. Just click on one of them.